I grew up poor. So I got my first Lamborghini when I was like 37, I think. And, uh, dude, totally changed my life. Cause I thought at the time it was just this impossible thing that I had on my wall. It's like, Oh, I'm never going to have it. Like it, the Lambo and a jet and a yacht and all these things. It's just, it's just impossible, you know? And then when I finally, I think I sold my third company and I had enough money from that one to be like, well, actually, I actually can afford this now. And then I had that, you know, a couple months of like thinking I was hot shit because I got this Lamborghini. It's impossible. And I pulled my life and I got it and everything. And then I realized through having that car and meeting other people who have like real money, I was like, oh my God, I feel poor again. <laughs> it's just a car. <laughs> yeah, it's just a car. And also I didn't realize the difference between a car like that, which is roughly like 300 grand new and, uh, you know, a yacht, which could be 5 million and a jet, which could be 50 million. I just put them all in the category of impossible. So I don't realize how many levels are to it. And entrepreneurship is kind of like a ladder game, right? So like, there's no, there's, but you have to understand going into it that there is no top ladder. There is no top dog. And even, you know, whether it's Bezos or Musk go back and forth on quote unquote, the richest man in the world. Um, even at the top, you're not on the top for long. It's like the UFC game. You're not on the top for long. It's always somebody doing something different, a bit bigger, better, whatever. So you have to really go into it deciding at what level do I define success and kind of decide to step off at whatever level that is. If that's uh, Lambo money, cool. That cost me three to $5,000 a month. So you don't need to make $300,000. You just need to make monthly enough where you can spend off three to $5,000 a month which might be, uh, you know, a VA benefits might be that. So you can do have a normal life. And then if you want to prioritize and spend that money on that, you can get a Lambo and live a regular life other than that. It's not out of place. A couple of rungs above that, you know, a $5 million yacht is a different, <laughs> that's a different game. That's like, you know, maybe 20 grand a month or something like that. So that's, that's a not different VA level. benefits. It's not VA benefits. <laughs> yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back. My guest this time moved a lot as a kid. And what this did was it developed a sense of, I'll do things my way, a sense of, I'm gonna live my life to the beat of my own drum. Coming out of high school, college was definitely not an option. What he wanted to do though was the most challenging thing to define who he was as a man. Climbing Mount Everest was too expensive for him. So the next option was Navy SEALs. He went in in 1997. He ultimately served 10 years. Again, that life by the beat of his own drum kind of had an impact on his exit out. He was assigned as a buzz instructor at the time asked to deploy to the Middle East and got the response of your skills are better utilized here in a training capacity. He didn't want to do that. He was already though down the path of being an entrepreneur. While he was active, he was the, or is the co-founder of the clothing line Forged. So he already had that experience under his belt. And so he chose to get out. Today, he's started and sold multiple companies. And currently, he and his wife own Industry Threadworks. It's another apparel-related company. This was a fun conversation, so let's get into it. Here's episode 141 with Ryan Williams. Did you get a workout in yet today? Not yet, not yet. I've become an afternoon guy. I, I, I give you credit. I can't. I got to get it in in the morning and mm. then get it out of the way. I've tried. I just, man, maybe it's like PTZ from Buds or something. <laughs> I just hate getting up early, dude. I'm, I'm no Jocko. No, I like a good, good 2 p.m. workout. It's good for me. Are you part of that group that said, I spent enough time in cold water. I don't need to do the ice baths? Oh, I don't do any of that stuff. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm okay with purposeful suffering, but just <laughs> to like randomly kick myself in the balls. Like, no, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah. So like I was explaining, I like to give listeners a complete package of you. So let's start way back at the beginning. Where's hometown? Uh, well, I, 
loaded question. Okay. <laughs> I grew up, I went to five different high schools in three different states and I didn't graduate any of them. I dropped out of high school halfway through my senior year. Um, but most of that time was spent in Santa Rosa, California, like Northern California. It's like 45 minutes of, you know, North of San Francisco and, uh, Northern California, if nobody's been there, like great winery now <laughs> that I appreciate now that I'm, you know, 46, a little bit older, but, uh, as an adult, I, I don't know why people live in Northern California. It's like all the things or people complain about. Yeah. Cause all the people complain about California is like all the taxes and none of the weather. So yeah, that's why, uh, I don't live there anymore. Is that where you were born? Yeah, Northern California. I lived there until I was about 15, and then uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico for a while, Bellingham, Washington for a while, uh, and then back to Santa Fe for two schools there. And uh, yeah, cruise around. What caused your family to move or for you to move with your family so much? Uh, my dad wasn't around, and my mom just, honestly, we were really poor growing up, and then she decided she was tired of being poor and pulled herself up by her bootstraps and started... Uh, writing books about um, uh, computers, which in the, you know, the early nineties were, was a big thing. Right. And so that was, that took off her books started getting translated in like 40 something languages and known all around the world. So got a little bit of money. And so we moved, she moved to Santa Fe and I hated it there. So I moved up with my dad in Washington uh, for a year. He kicked me out. I moved back down to Santa Fe, went to prep school, which absolutely sucked. And then, uh, left there to go to the public school, but then my credits didn't transfer. So they told me like basically my, that my second quarter at the public school after the first quarter of the private school, they're like, Hey, uh, none of your credits transferred and you're going to have to come back and do your first half of your senior year over again. I'm like, I'm, I'm not doing that. I don't, I don't care. I'm like 17. I'm like, I don't, I don't care. I know everything. Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't <laughs> that. I just didn't care. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to come back and redo half my senior year. What are, the, what are the other options? Well, you can continue on, but you're not going to graduate. So that's pointless. And, or you could drop out. I'm like, okay, I'll drop out. And it was funny because the the guy at the time, the principal, said, are you sure you want to do this? Because like, if you ever want to join the military, you can't, you can't get in without a high school degree. I'm like, fuck that, dude. I'm never joining the military. <laughs> at the time, it was like the antithesis of what I, what I had in my life and what I wanted. So I wasn't worried about it. And yeah, I dropped out at 17 and uh, got my GD a couple months later. And yeah, and then moved to, I think I went to Havis, no, I went to Mammoth first for uh, snowboarding. I was a snowboard bum up there for like a year. And then I went to That's Havasu. That's a horrible existence. It was fun, man. It was great. <laughs> it was great. Just getting high, running the lifts. <laughs> it was awesome. No responsibility. Um, it was great. Learned a lot. Uh, mainly like, you know, things, I turned 18 out there and uh, there's a lot you learn when you turn 18, like how the world really functions as opposed to like how you think it functions. So a lot of wake up calls in that. Um, and then the next year I went and uh, was trying to get on the pro circuit for freestyle jet skiing like stand up jet skiing. So I moved to uh, Havasu with my jet ski, but me being a dumbass teenager didn't think if it, I should probably have a trailer for it. So I, sh I shoved it in the back of my like <laughs> single cab, like pickup truck and drove out there. And I think I drove it like once that whole year I was out there. And then it just became like, it was my living room, but I had no money. I'd like, I would live on what called tuna surprise. So it was like rice and tuna. So you get like a whole with mustard on it. So you got a whole meal for like, a dollar fifty sounds amazing. Yeah, lawn furniture, <laughs> lawn furniture for my my living room apartment. But yeah, I think it's I think it's important to go through those stages. You know, you really feel like you're learning yourself at that stage. And I think following on, there's there's a certain level of self learning that occurs when you leave the military too. Which um, yeah, we'll we'll get into whenever. But but yeah, at, at the end of me fucking around and all that, I was like okay, well, what do I want to do now? 19, like, who, who am I as a person? Like, the world is big. I've come to the conclusion, like, the world's huge. There's so much opportunity. There's so much stuff. And I'm such a small piece of it. Like, who am I and how do I fit into the world? And so I started to figure out, okay, well, I need to, I need to do something that uh, is challenging. I need to find out who I am. So what's the hardest thing? And the internet in 1996 was obviously not what it is today. <laughs> so I was Shocker. like, oh, yeah. So I'm like researching stuff and I, I'd never heard of Navy SEALs before, but I was just like researching random stuff and saw like, okay, climbing Mount Everest would be 
extremely difficult, but that cost like 50 grand at the time, which I of course didn't have. And the other thing was, you know, Navy SEAL was at the time, I think still probably considered generally like the hardest military training in, in at least the United States. And so I was like, okay, that seems like reasonable. And also it seemed like it, it seemed more pragmatic to me to start at the top the very hardest thing. And if I didn't make it be like, okay, cool, I'll do whatever the next hardest thing is, you know what I mean? And I researched that, but uh, it just happened to work out that I, I happened to make it through and it was, a, you know, a whole experience in itself. But the real reason that I joined was not, I mean, this is pre 9-11, this is 1997. So there was no, wasn't real patriotic. It wasn't any sense of duty. I didn't grow up in a military household. It was really just selfishly. I, I wanted to find out who I was as a man, as a person. I wanted to see where I fit in the world. And the more I researched, um, Navy SEALs and red books, um, you know, those all the Dick Marcinko books of the time, which are classics now, um, they're almost comic -y, comical, but, uh, I started to respect those guys a lot and I wanted to respect myself as much as I respected them. So I was like, okay, if I'm on this journey of discovering myself, I was, I was a weird kid. So these are the things I thought of like 18 or 19. Can I take you back just a little bit? Yeah, sure. So you bounced around schools. Yeah. What was for you? Did you enjoy school from the academic side? I hated it. I hated it. I never did homework. If I didn't enjoy something, I just wouldn't do it. Like straight up, I just wouldn't turn in my homework. I wouldn't do the classes. I just didn't care. It's weird. Even though I was like in fifth grade, I remember the teacher told me to uh, to do something, and I was like, I was like, this isn't going to help me in my life. Like I'm I'm not going to do it. And I put my feet up on the desk. I'm like fifth grade. I'm like, who does that? And it sounds like a weird story now, but I was like, you know what? This nature versus nurture thing. I I, I don't know how exactly it functions, but. I do know that there are certain parts of me that have evolved and, and that are continuing to evolve, but there's also certain parts of me that are just have always been the way they are. And I think that's just one part of me that like, if I don't want to do something, I'm just not, I'm just not going to do it. Like I never even got my DD 214. Like I just got out. They gave me this big checkout sheet and like, you need to do all this. And it's like 25 people you got to sign off with. And it's like everybody. And I'm like, dude, I didn't went to one person. I'm like, this is fucking stupid. Like, what do you do? Not pay me if I, get, <laughs> you're gonna, I'm going to get out anyway. So I just did one sign off sheet and left. I didn't even get my DD 214. So when I say like, has I, that had a negative impact on you in any way? No, I took a DOD job right after getting out. So I had to have a, a working copy of my DD 214. So I got that to get the job and got I just it. never went back. Cause I like, man, when it, like, when I hate stuff, I just, I just <laughs> don't do it and for the detriment. Like I still don't have any benefits from the VA or anything which my wife is always, she's like, just a three, four grand a month that you can get for free. I just don't want to do the paperwork. So that, anyway, that, that sounds, I mean, in a weird way, that's almost kind of like a life motto, you know, <laughs> yeah. from, but from almost a negative side of it. Yeah. It's not good. <laughs> but at the same token, it's, it says something about you and kind of how we're, where your mind's wired is, Hey, I'll make my own path. And if I don't have to carry, if I don't have to bring this baggage with me, oh, well. Yeah. I think that's the thing. I've always had just kind of this, this hard reset or like, or this hard floor where I'm like, this is what I'm not willing to do. And I just never do it. And like, I, you know, doesn't work out very well a lot of times, <laughs> but it is useful sometimes. Like when you want to hold the line, you want to like hold yourself to a certain standard. It is useful in those capacities. Cause I just, I just, I won't let myself do things that I don't feel uh, aren't within my character. You know what I mean? Like returning the shopping cart or picking up dog shit or whatever it happens to be, you know, but I generally, <clears throat> I generally think of myself as a fairly good person. At least I try to be most times. So I kind of guide myself with that. And I think like paperwork and doing the DD 214, like I just, I just don't care. Do you find that you hold other people that are in your life to your standard of almost I judge you more on your character than anything else. You know what I, I, I used to, and it really caused me a lot of problems because, uh, and this is something I learned in entrepreneurship where I was, I was really bad at negotiating, making deals. Cause I would always make deals with somebody assuming that they wanted the same thing I did. Like, I want you to make money. I want to make money. Let's win together. Let's create a win-win scenario. And then I entered a lot of these situations and I realized, man, these other people don't think of the world the same way I do. And, um, I got myself in a lot of bad situations, situations where I kind of got screwed. And I was like, shit, this is not, I, I need to be more understanding of how other people view the world 
in order to operate more effectively in the world. Um, so that was a big wake up call for me. It's actually a good book, uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. It helped me understand a lot um, about not really negotiation, but understanding the same situation from somebody else's viewpoint. And that's been extremely valuable for me in just like kind of understanding not only my place in things, but if I want to get here, I need other people involved too. And how do I get them to want the same things that I want? You know, and it's, it's been really helpful structuring deals. Do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have, um, well, they're all half, but I have a uh, half brother who's, I'm 46, so he'd be 42, and a half sister, she'd be 38. Uh, the same mom, different dads. And then I have a little brother from my dad who's 18 now. What was, were you, as far as like when you were growing up, did you have much interaction with them? And what were you as the older brother? Were you kind of the nurturing type or like, hey, just leave me alone. I'm on my own. No, I didn't like them. <laughs> I didn't like them at all. Uh, I still don't like them. I haven't talked to them. And well, my little brother is 18. Uh, I, t- I talked to him a lot. He's, he's a great kid. Like he's, he's an awesome adult. Like he's, he's just a rad person. Uh, my other little brother and sister that are in their like late thirties and forties now. Um, I, I don't know. It's weird. I never liked them. And, uh, I haven't talked to them in probably 12 years and I'll probably never talk to them again. It's not that they're, they're not bad people. You know what I mean? They're very nice. They just, they don't add anything to my life and they don't really like me. And I'm like, that's fine. So I don't expect anything from them and they don't expect anything from me. And we just have this agreement that, you know, we're just not in each other's lives. And it's totally fine. But I think that's an example of that kind of hard deck where I'm like, I'm just, I'm totally okay with not ever speaking to significant parts of my family, like forever. And it doesn't, it doesn't bother me, you know? Whereas I think that's why I think my story might not be a great example for a lot of people because I'm just kind of weird like that. Um, but also maybe there's some weird people listening who are like, yeah, I'm fine. And then like, it's okay to be like that. <laughs> Almost three years into this. The one thing I would definitely say is, is that every story is different, but I'm certain that there are many more who can relate to your, your story than you really realize. Yeah. One thing I found, man, just talking to a bunch of people is like you only see the world from your viewpoint, right? So I've approached my situations in my world and in certain ways, and I view it a certain way, but talking with people, I'm constantly surprised how different other people view the same situation. Like when people want to do entrepreneurship or they want to go a certain path in their career or something, um, and their family doesn't approve, like it really affects them. Like it really hurts them. It, it really changes the dynamic of their decision-making and that sometimes blows my mind because like you're who cares? You know what I mean? Like what's the worst, what's the worst case scenario that happens if you're a grown ass person and your mom doesn't like your decision on entrepreneurship or your dad doesn't like it? Like worst case scenario, they tell you they don't like it. Like what are they going to do? Beat you up? <laughs> like <laughs> it, it only matters to the point that you, uh, you allow it to matter. You know what I mean? Like family is only what you, what, Family is only as valuable as the value you ascribe to it. It doesn't have to mean anything. It should. And it's great if it does. It's fantastic to have a great family life, but it's not, it, it shouldn't, it should add to your life. It shouldn't run your life. If that makes sense. You already hit on it, but when you started researching the seals and, and obviously there was limited information on the internet, you could take this, the complete opposite extreme. And you've got so many younger people today that have grown up on social media and that affirmation from what they deem as their sphere of influence becomes very important to them. And mm-hmm. so, like you said, when they do approach adversity, part of it is wanting that validation from outside that how they feel or how they're seeing it is is correct or at least correct to their group. Yeah. And I think it's important to to really audit whose opinion you uh, take in, you know, what I mean, because everybody has an opinion, but if you respect somebody, then it would make sense that you value their opinion. You know what I mean? Like just, but just cause you're connected to somebody doesn't mean you res- you need to respect them. And also just cause you respect them for a certain area doesn't necessarily mean that you need to respect them in other areas. So like you might have a family member who's a doctor and you, you respect their opinion in doctor things. But at the same time, if you're talking about like astrophysicists or, or, you know, anything else or entrepreneurship or business, if they don't agree with you, you don't have to listen to them. 
you know? So, um, but also I think you, you kind of build your circle as you get older and or reduce it. Or do, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's definitely some, some builder supplied as you get older, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but also all the people in my life now, they're very interesting people. They're all very accomplished people, whether that's, you know, successfully accomplished or physically accomplished, or they, they've all made something of themselves. And they're all what I like to call like main characters. You know what I mean? Like they're main characters of their lives, the main characters of other people's lives. And that's how I feel like people should be, be the main character of your own story, but be a, strong supporting role in other people's stories as well. So that's kind of what I've tried to build in my, my group now. And all those people, I value their opinion highly. And I would hope if I'm doing something that's just like, say out of character for me, or if I'm being a piece of shit or I'm doing something that like that goes against how they view me and they know me very well, I would hope they'd step up and be like, Hey Ryan, like, you know, I saw you doing this thing. Like what's going on, man. And I'd be like, Oh, Shit, you know what? You're right. I, I was out of line there. I did screw this up. I can do better. But if somebody off the street, I mean, you know how it is running running ads on Instagram and all these people, everybody has an opinion. And then then you look at their <laughs> you look at their profile <laughs> picture and like, bro, I wouldn't give a shit what you think about anything in your life. And I'm supposed to value your opinion on on this particular topic. Like, so it's I think I think it's particularly difficult for young people. Um, I know I struggle with this when I was younger. Because you don't know how to filter people's opinions, you know, you don't know who is an authority on, on different things. And the problem with the internet now or, or social media in general is everybody's pretending to be an authority <laughs> on stuff. And you got all these people espousing stuff, especially in entrepreneurship that like, oh, you just buy my course and you get a Lamborghini. I'm like, dude, I've had a couple of Lamborghinis and it's the car itself isn't, isn't difficult. It's getting to the point where the car, where you understand that the car doesn't mean anything. That's the difficult part because I, you know, I grew up poor. So I got my first Lamborghini when I was like 37, I think. And, uh, dude, it totally changed my life. Cause I thought at the time it was just this impossible thing that I had on my wall. It's like, Oh, I'm never going to have it. Like it, a Lambo and a jet and a yacht and all these things. It's just, it's just impossible, you know? And then when I finally, I think I sold my third company and I had enough money from that one to be like, well, actually, actually can afford this now and then i had that you know a couple months of like thinking i was hot shit because i got this lamborghini it's impossible and i pull in my life and i got it and everything and then i realized through having that car and meeting other people who have like real money i was like oh my god i feel poor again <laughs> it's just a car <laughs> yeah it's just a car and also i didn't realize the difference between a car like that which is roughly like 300 grand new and uh, you know, a yacht, which could be 5 million and a jet, which could be 50 million. I just put them all in the category of impossible. So I don't realize how many levels there are to it. And entrepreneurship is kind of like a ladder game, right? So like, there's no, there's, but you have to understand going into it that there is no top ladder. There is no top dog. And even, you know, whether it's Bezos or Musk go back and forth on quote unquote, the richest man in the world. Um, even at the top, you're not on the top for long. It's like the UFC game. You're not on the top for long. There's always somebody doing something different, a bit bigger, better, whatever. So you have to really go into it deciding at what level do I define success and kind of decide to step off at whatever level that is. If that's uh, Lambo money, cool. That costs me three to $5,000 a month. So you don't need to make $300,000. You just need to make monthly enough where you can spend off three to $5,000 a month which might be, uh, you know, a VA benefits might be that. So you can do have a normal life. And then if you want to prioritize and spend that money on that, you can get a Lambo and live a regular life other than that. And it's not out of place. A couple of rungs above that, you know, finally dollar yacht is a different, <laughs> that's a different game. That's like, you know, maybe 20 grand a month or something like that. So that's, that's a not different VA level. benefits. It's not VA benefits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was really eye opening to me to kind of be able to dive into that world of people who had, you know, real money and realize like, oh shit, I'm not as cool as I thought I was. I'm not even rich at all. <laughs> I just have an extra three to five thousand dollars a month, which most of the people I was talking to at that point, that's like nothing. You know what I mean? Like that's their nails. That's their, their <laughs> girlfriend's like nail budget. I'm like, oh wow. So that was really, uh, really interesting for me. But, um, but through that process, I had to really define like, okay, what do I define as success? Like, how far up this ladder do I want to go? Do I want to, you know, try to be the richest man in the world? Like. Not really. I mean, that's probably 
more negative comes with that than positive, I would imagine. Um, but I do want to have enough money. How I define it myself is what's the meaning of life, right? So the meaning of life, I think, is to enjoy it as much as possible in, in whatever way, as long as you're not hurting anybody, to be able to do whatever you want and have to experience life as fully and richly as possible. So that usually means experiences. So experiences, for the most part, cost money. So if like, hey, let's let's go to Chamonix tomorrow and have brunch, you can't do that for 500 bucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, okay, in order to experience this, that costs a certain amount. And so it's like, okay, if I want to live my life and really experience life as a human, what's that going to take? Like, what does true freedom cost in the way that I want? I'm not talking about like flying private every day or buying a jet or whatever. Um, so I figured that's probably, you know, nothing crazy, probably take home a million and a half a year, 2 million a year. And there's lots of people that, that make that. I don't make that personally now, but, um, I think that's a reasonable attainable goal now. But the thing about goals is once I get there, just like the car, like <laughs> that's as far as I could see. Once I get there, I'm sure I'll see further and, you know, set another goal because ultimately, man, like it's, it's about the journey, you know, I think to, to build anything of consequence, like you have to fall in love with the journey and really find enjoyment in it, or at least find a little bit of satisfaction because it's so hard to really attain like true success that unless you, unless you love the journey, if you're doing sh stuff that's painful for you or that hurts you and you just, you wake up in the morning and like, fuck this, I cannot do this you're never going to be successful. And even if you do succeed, what did you get? You got money in the bank, but you hate your life. Like that's, that's not success. You know what I mean? Um, cause financial success is sometimes different than, than, you know, living in like human success. So, but I think too many people chase the wrong thing. They chase other people's version of success or they chase a car or some monetary thing. But unless that thing is actually going to make you happy, unless you know that, even if you achieve it, you're just achieving somebody else's version of success and you'll likely feel just as hollow, just as unfulfilled without that. So yeah, I think people really need to think about where they want to go before they even start the entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship journey. Um, because it is harder than most people think it is and it never ends. And it's like, there's way, if, I was talking to a buddy of mine about this the other day, he's active duty seal and he's got like 10 years in, which is the, time that I left and I told him I was like and he's looking at my life and entrepreneurship stuff and and uh we lived together and and uh we have a uh, you know just lift and talk business and stuff and it's like oh I kind of want to get out and do what you do I'm like bro and I know his personality he's a fantastic team guy um but he's very much like he likes being in a, not a system but he he likes the um Regimen or rigid. Regi yeah, he likes the the predictability of it, and uh, and he's good at it. He's really good at it, and he's a great dude. And he's he's the exact type of people that, that the SEAL teams needs to retain. And so I told him, it's like, look, man, like I might look on the outside, like, yeah, I got a cool car, and like might look like cool stuff, but the reality is, like, it's hard as shit. It feels like I'm gonna lose my business every week. Something new pops up that I got to put a fire out and we're always juggling chainsaws and sometimes the chainsaws are on fire. <laughs> like this, if you just want to make money, there are way easier ways to make money than what I'm doing. And I told him this, like, look, man, one of the things I didn't realize when I got out at 10 years, um, so I got out in 08 and I took a job, uh, working for the department of defense as a GS, as a, uh, civilian instructor in the SQT pipeline. So there's, there's buds for the SEAL program. And then there's SQT, which is about six months after that. And then after that, they get the trident and they go to a team. So I went from buds instructor teaching third phase to SQT instructor teaching that as a civilian. And so, uh, I have a lot of time in that. And I saw a lot of people roll, roll into that process. What I didn't realize is getting in the DOD system. I thought the other retirements were like, I came in at 19 and 20 years and I got retirement at 39. They're not like that. So like in DOD, if I got out at 10, so I was, I think 28 at yeah, 20 or 29 when I got out, uh, I would have had to pay a couple grand a month into my DOD to get retirement when I turned 55. And I was like, holy crap, that's a huge difference. You know? So I did the math on it. I was like, look, man, you came in say at 20 and you do 20 years and you get out, you're going to get, let's say 
four grand a month with all your VA benefits and all that. Let's say it's just four grand a month. The next 40 years, let's say you die at 80. The next 40 years, that's 1.9 million. Not accounting for the incremental adjustments. That's 1.9 million in the bank that you have retirement. Like that's more money than I have saved up, bro. You're good. You're fine. And if you want to get even like more <laughs> successful than that, um, just do real estate. I'm like, just, just get a house, sit on it for the next 10 years. You'll be fine. Like you got steady money coming in and you're going to have a job that you really enjoy. That's fulfilled. Like, and you're doing great work for everybody. I'm like, dude, that's, that's what you should do with your life. Don't follow me on my plan. Like I'm constantly fucking filming a robo with like, sometimes got a 500 horsepower engine on this fucking dinghy. And like <laughs> somebody's drilling holes in the bottom. I'm plugging one hole. Another one comes up. And like, sometimes we're, we're on plane and we're crushing. And sometimes it feels like we're going to get crushed and we're just running into a pile of rocks. And like, but I love that journey because my version of life is, is a lot of experiences. And man, like if you want a lot of diverse experiences, holy crap, entrepreneurship is where it's at. But if you want a like a more safe approach, man, there's so many other better ways to do it. Like real estate's a great one. Passive investments, another one. Uh, like my other buddy, uh, Chris Stoddard is a former Marine and now a, a pilot for uh, one of the airlines. And he's crushing. He's got real estate investments. He's got regular investments. He's got a bunch of like boats and st- I mean, he's doing great. And I'm like, dude, that's, that's an awesome way to do it. I just chose this, you know, hair on fire type situation that I'm in, which, you know, works for me, but it's also exhausting. And I'm 46 now. And I'm like, dude, do I want to be doing this shit when I'm 55? I'm like, I don't know, maybe not. So we're, we're in the middle of changing a bunch of stuff in our, in our business as well. Before we go forward, you've already opened up other questions that I want to ask, but real quick for you as a young man, were you a good kid? Did you cross? Cause you talked about how you had your own mindset. Hey teach, I don't want to do this homework. I'm going to put my feet up on the desk in fifth grade, mm-hmm. but were you a rule breaker or did you just kind of like ride that envelope? And mm-hmm. in conjunction with that, what was your relationship like with your parents? I followed my own rules that I was okay with. And I thought, well, you know, uh, it doesn't really make sense that I shouldn't be allowed to drive. So I would take my mom's car out and just go driving and taught myself how to, and it's a stick shift. It was a really <laughs> fast little turbo car. I'm just cruising around. And, you know, I think I was 15, uh, no license, no, just nothing at all. No, no learner's permit, anything. And I just take the car out and go rip around doing like 140. And thank God I didn't get caught for any of this stuff. Like, well, that's a whole other conversation about like how the universe works and like my, what led me to believe in God. But holy cow, man. Like, yeah, my life was like, I was very regimented by like, I never, broke my own rules. So I was a good kid by, by my own rule book, but I did break a lot of society's rules. I did do a lot of, you know, illegal stuff. Um, but I, I thought I was a good kid, but yeah, probably my dad wasn't around, but yeah, my mom probably uh, would say I was a difficult child. (laughs) When you say you wanted to challenge yourself, well, two directions I want to go the principal or the guidance counselor, whoever it was, when you decided to drop out, said, hey, you'll never be able to go in the military. But at that point in time in your life, coming towards the end of high school, did you have a plan for what you thought your future would be? No, honestly, I thought I was going to join a biker gang. I thought that was like, you know, this will fit. I'll be like Hunter Thompson or go out and join a biker gang and then write a book. I didn't realize those two things are you know, diametrically <laughs> opposed at the time. And uh, this is a dumb, a dumb little kid's idea. But I do think that the SEAL teams, especially pre-9-11, where I came in like the, the late 90s, it was kind of like, like I don't want to say a gang, but it was like a, a biker club, very similar to a biker club. I've never been in a biker club, but, you know, read some books, I'm interested in it, so in, enough to know that there are some similarities. And uh, I, I really well, When you look that. at most of the members come from the military. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, yeah, I could see the, that. And that the thing they always talk about is one of the thing they're searching for is that camaraderie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you definitely get that on the teams. I mean, it was really cool, but it's also very disheartening too because um, a lot of the dudes, and this is something that I've struggled my whole life, where I think other people are like me and they view the world the same way I do. Where I was, a, I was a good, I was a very average team guy, but I was a good new guy. Like I took the trash out. It's always like, yeah, let's go, like supermoto. 
and I did my job, you know, okay, to the best of my ability and never complained. And so I was a good new guy, but I didn't realize that like, yeah, just cause you go through buds with somebody, just cause they're another team guy, doesn't mean they're a good person. So like, yeah, my first wife was banging a bunch of dudes. I got, I went through buds with like a whole bunch of things that happened where I'm like, wow, like not everybody's, not every seal is a great dude. Not every person's, a, you know, views the world the same way I do. And so it, it kind of disillusioned me for a while and I got really pissed and, and upset about it. And then I realized like, that's just, that's just life. You know what I mean? That's just what happens. And everybody deals with pain and loss and betrayal in their own way. And there's, there's nobody gets through life without scars. You know what I mean? It's like life is a freaking fight. Like it's like stepping in the ring, expecting not to get hit. Like nobody's that good. Everybody who steps in the ring gets hit. It's, part of this part of the process part of the journey and you can't escape it it's just life and there's certain things that you get hit a little bit more like i think entrepreneurship is one of those things where you're definitely getting punched in the face a lot but you get better and you learn you know so if you choose to be you know in that high velocity arena of entrepreneurship yeah just know going into it like getting punched in the face more than you would be if you're like you know a mailman or something like that but i'm sure a mailman they don't have an easy life either everybody's got their own problems no, and every job is different. And, and the only thing, the way I would attribute it is when you talk about entrepreneurship, it's it's kind of like saying, hey, I want to go learn how to box. And so for the average job, you're just, you're thinking about, oh, I just got to block punches, but now I'm going to step in an MMA ring and now I got to worry about kicks and I got, you know, yeah. and, and that's where when you take on the responsibility of saying, I'm going to run my own company. Now I've got to look at it from every angle. Yeah. Every one of us goes to a job. And there's aspects that we necessarily don't like, but when you punch out and go home, the boss is worrying about right. it, not you. Yeah. And that's what people don't, don't understand from the employee perspective. It's like, well, employees should get paid and they should get ownership of the business. And it's not like, okay, cool. If you acted like an owner, but most employees don't want to take on the stress. They don't want to take on the responsibility. They, like there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into it. that aren't really tangible. They're not really even monetary. And um, there, there is a different mentality that you, you have to be, you have to have in order to be, I think, an effective uh, entrepreneur, or I don't want to say boss, because it's not really a good leader, I think would be a better term for it. Yeah. Challenging yourself to go towards the SEAL community. Were you somebody who was physically fit or physically active as a kid growing up? Um, I was active, uh, but no, I wasn't, wasn't like genetically gifted by any means. I was, you know, six one, fairly tall, uh, lanky. But, uh, so I was okay at running, but never very strong or powerful, mostly like decent endurance. So I was good at like cross country running or something like that. But when I was like 185 pounds, it's pretty easy. Now I'm 235. I'm like 50 pounds makes a big difference and you're ready. Yeah. Well, I can still yeah. run a 630 mile, but just one. Just one. <laughs> yeah. For your family, were they, did you even seek anybody's input when you decided to go towards the military? Uh, no, no. My mom was very anti-military. So, but I didn't, you know, didn't affect me. I was like, cool, thanks. All right, I'm going, bye. Uh, but she's always super supportive of anything anyway. And my dad didn't know what Navy SEALs were or anything. Um, so he didn't know. No, it was just, it was just me. It was just my own journey. And uh, yeah, it's just, like I said, just a selfish, selfish exploration of, you know, my own life. 1997, you went in. Yeah. At that time, were they offering contracts or did you have to go to an A school and then submit for both the way it worked at the time is so i went under uh what's called a die fair contract which i don't think it exists anymore but uh you had to go th you had to choose an a school and there's a few few a schools which is like your rating or job in, in the navy and so i chose aviation ordinance men uh, primarily because the school for that was in pensacola florida so i only chose that so i could go run on the beach and train for butts like if it wasn't for trying to be a seal i, I would have never joined the military at all it wasn't my jam i, I only wanted to join to try to be a seal that that was my only function so every choice i made was to get closer and closer to that uh so yeah i chose aviation ordinance men went to boot camp uh a school and then buds and the die fair program gives you a guaranteed shot a shot in boot camp at uh the physical uh whatever it calls the test gates yeah physical test gates to get to uh a spot of buds i think it was a lot easier to get to buds back then too there's less people trying. It wasn't as well known. Um, so it was pretty like the, uh, I think the standards are actually easier too. I think the standards are pretty tough now. 
back then, yeah, I wasn't very good at any of it. I think I've, I think I failed the pull ups. It was it was like eight pull ups, and I couldn't even do like eight <laughs> pull ups, man. Yeah, it was it was definitely a different time. Um, but yeah, things just work out. You know, yeah, I got lucky in a lot of ways. Were you able to get through the first one one shot? Yeah, my class two nineteen started with I think one hundred and fifty five guys, and we graduated at the end of it. The guys who made it straight through, I think, was fourteen of us. But our graduating class was fifty. I think 55 dudes, which is fairly large at the time, but you know, 40 of those were 41 of those were, were rollbacks at some point, but it's, it's super common. It's, it's actually pretty rare to make it th- straight through being somebody who kind of danced to their own tune and, and made your own decisions on what worked for you. How did you find the, the regiment of being in the military and kind of having to follow along with the rules? <laughs> At the time when I was coming into it, uh, it was fine. I didn't have a problem with it, except for boot camp. I hated boot camp because there was no there was no point to it. You know what I mean? Like, why the fuck am I ironing underwear? I'm ironing <laughs> underwear. So that that bothered me. I'm like, dude, I'd rather go hit the surf ten times than iron one piece of <laughs> underwear because there's no point to it. You know what I mean? But everything that we did at Buds once I got there, I was like, oh, this. This makes sense. This is training me to do something else. This is my goal is to be a SEAL. So everything leading up to this is part of it. So when they're messing with you, I'm like, okay, that's part of it. Um, I only thought about quitting once in Buzz, and that was the very first day. Just because I hadn't had, I, I didn't grow up with my dad, so I didn't have a whole lot of like uh, male, especially like, I don't say macho male, but like that, that uh, alpha male type energy or camaraderie or even the humor i didn't understand humor i was like a super fucking robot you know and uh so i got in there i'm like holy cow every other student here is bigger than me stronger than me faster than me better shape than me we got like literally iron man athletes next to me and guys who look like bodybuilders and the instructors are all like super jacked and intimidating i'm like what am i what am i doing here and i thought dude what did i get myself into i'm probably in over my head um, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a day. I'll give it a day. I'll go through it. And if I still feel like this tomorrow, or maybe it was the end of the week, but it was either a day or a couple of days. If I still felt like this by the end of this time frame, I'll go, I'll quit. I'll go out to the fleet, get bigger, faster, stronger, whatever. And then come back where I feel like I'm better fit for it. And then the next day we started actually, yeah, it was, it was just that, that check-in period. And then the next day we started actually doing stuff like going here in the surf and, and going running and going to the chow hall. And I'm like, Oh, this is the shit I read about. This is the stuff in the books. And I was so excited about all the stuff that I was like, I didn't even, it, I mean, it sucked going through, but it didn't bother me. I didn't, I didn't think about quitting. Cause I was like, this is awesome. I'm like in my dream, you know, I, I wanted it so bad. And then it was here. I'm like, Fuck yes. But there's that time frame where like, you only do fuck yes for a little while. And they're like, man, this log is really heavy. <laughs> but thankfully, um, and they, they plan out buds super well, which I learned later on as an instructor where it's, it's actually very regimented where just when I was like, Oh dude, this is getting like base tour really sucks. This boat is really heavy. They're like, Oh, next thing. I'm like, Oh, I started to see the patterns in it. And, uh, yeah, it was really, it was really an interesting process. Had you done anything before that to push yourself to that level mentally as a, a young man or anything? Or was that the first time you really had to kind of look inside yourself? Oh man, my, my entire athletic career in high school consisted of like junior varsity badminton. <laughs> that was it, dude. I didn't even make the varsity team in badminton. I had like... Did you Nothing even try out guys. though? <laughs> or yeah, did they even no, let you try yeah, out? I, I tried. I tried to do badminton. I just wasn't good enough. I tried to do volleyball. Um, I, re- I really wasn't good enough to compete at anything. And frankly, I didn't really like competing either, um, especially in team sports. But uh, no, when, when I decided that I was going to try to be a SEAL, I went 100% in like 100% focus. I would learn as much as I can. Uh, Stu Smith's books, actually, that guy's been around a long time, dude, because <laughs> I, I bought his stuff to go use as like the basis of the training for it and at, at the time i mean training especially the first part of training has changed a lot but um it worked out great and i just honestly i just ran a lot and did a lot of calisthenics and um i was pretty pretty well prepared at the time i could run like six minute mile for four miles and like 
be, be fine with it. And uh, so when I got to Buds, I found that like I was I was actually one of the better runners, which helped a lot actually. Like it really did help. But yeah, I wasn't very strong. Struggled on pull ups a lot. I was okay at push ups and okay at sit ups, but no, I wasn't exceptionally physically gifted by any means. From day one, when you were looking left and right and going, "What the hell am I doing here?" Do you remember a specific moment where you're like, "I got this." I I and now actually felt like you ha- you belong there. I don't know if that was a feeling I got, but it, the only feeling I got where I was like, "Holy shit, this might actually happen." was uh it wasn't even the first phase because there, there's a lot of guys we had five guys quit after hell week in my class which is kind of rare um but it was after i made it through pool comp in second phase which is like the second big hump where we lose a lot of people uh because the first portion buds buds is uh the first portion is physical second portion is diving and third portion is uh like land warfare super super basic stuff and the physical portion i mean you can be a real meathead and just muscle through stuff and be fine. So the diving portion is really, it's very technical. Um, it's a lot of surprising amount of math involved in it and you have to follow processes and procedures. And that's really what it is. They're, they're weeding people out who can't follow processes and can't think under, under pressure, like literally (laughs) water pressure. (laughs) Um, so there are a lot of people that weed out from that process. So after I made it through that, I remember passing pool comp and swimming around in circles and like, Holy shit. I might actually become a seal. This is this is pretty freaking wild. And that gave me another bump to be like, okay, cool. Let's let's move on to third phase. Let's get through this. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was a uh, man. I keep I know I keep saying this, but it was really eye opening. The whole the whole process was exactly what I wanted from it. I learned a lot about myself from going through that. Um, it was. I think everybody should go through something like that, like their own version of that, especially at that age, because the older you get, the more baked you are and it's harder to change the ingredients and it's harder to to change the cake when it's like halfway through baking you know um but when you're that age i do think it's really important to do difficult things to kind of like test yourself and find out where you are just even just for the fact that like so you don't question yourself later you know were you mentioning not being a good student in school how how were the academics for you it was okay and also i had a i had a reason to lean into it you know, I've always been decent at math and most of diving is just, just math. So that was pretty easy. Some things I did struggle with though, were the abstract things. So like when I, I got a chance to go to sniper school, uh, it was kind of an odd path, but I, I, the slot for sniper school in 98, I just checked into the team and somebody couldn't go, they got in trouble and somebody else had some other issues. So they couldn't go. So it was like, I was like third tier to get in line for going to sniper school as a new guy, which is extremely rare. I didn't have my trident yet. And so I went to, I got a slot for sniper school and the shooting portion I was, I was okay. at. I didn't struggle with that because again, this mainly math and just, you know, some, some basics, but what really hung me up was the stocking portion. Um, cause at the time sniper school was the shooting portion was in Koalinga and I think it was a month and a half long, something like that. And then the shooting portion was, I think, or the, the stocking portion about a month out at, out of Nyland was our training area out in the desert. And what we would do out in the desert for stalking is you'd have, I mean, literally the desert, it's not like dunes, you know, but it's like a little shrubbery. So there's not a whole lot of places to hide. Like if you stand up, you can see somebody like a mile away, you know? <laughs> so, um, what they would do is they put an, an OP or observation post out, uh, between 800 and 1200 yards out. And then they'd say, okay, you guys, uh, your OP, your target is generally that direction, uh, go. And so the OP has just two guys with like 50 by 50 by spotting scopes looking directly this way. So your job, you have to get within 180 and 220 yards and take a shot without being seen. It's blanks, obviously. They're not like actually <laughs> shooting at the guys. Um, but I really struggled Come on, add this. a level of realism. Yeah, cause, cause, <laughs> and looking back, it's just because I didn't understand the math of it because I was like, dude, how am I going to... I don't even know where the OP is. I'm just, so I'm just like low crawling for like 500 yards, dragging this, in this ghillie suit, dragging this, this drag bag behind me. And I'm like, what the hell? Cause I, I look up and there's this, uh, there's this chief who's going through the time. Maybe he's E60 made chief later. He could have crawled he's, past me. <laughs> he's little, no, he's literally walking. <laughs> I'm like, what, how the hell I'm on my face, like crawling. And this dude's like walking 10 feet from me. And he just goes like, what's up, Brian? I'm like, what am I doing wrong, bro? Like, what am I doing wrong? And it was, it was very simple. What he did is 
I think there's there's another lesson here too is that um, you really have to identify where you're going first because what he did he used dead space so he he actually backed up got to a high position took a peek from like a, a taller tree or taller bush found the op was and saw okay well there's I can't walk straight forward because I'll be seen but there's a tall tree about 200 yards out if I just go 50 yards this way. I can literally just walk 200 yards and post up in the tree and be good. That's what he did. He found out where he needed to go. He moved laterally until he had dead space. Um, and then, so he was blocked from view from the OP and he just literally walked right by me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm 10 feet away on my face for like 500 yards. I'm like, Oh my God, I am not doing this right. Um, so I failed, I failed stalking portion my first time. I had an opportunity to go back and, and redo it later. But, uh, yeah, that was that was really eye opening for me. So I did struggle with some things. I got kicked out of jump school the first time as well. But that's the army's wacky. <laughs> I was wearing a watch to PT. It's not even a good story. <laughs> <laughs> that was when you said you got kicked out immediately. I'm thinking, oh, you put your feet up on the desk and told him I don't want to do oh. this. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the army is yeah, the army is difficult to deal with. I don't I don't think the pipeline goes there anymore. I think we have our own. But at the time, it was you go through buds. And then you go through Army Airborne School, and then you go through, uh, well, it's SQT now, SEAL Qualification Training, but the time was STT, SEAL Tactical Training. A whole, whole bunch of different changes happened, uh, mostly, you know, mostly positive. I think it's generally probably in most ways better than it was back then. It's definitely a lot more, uh, a lot more standardized and covers a lot more bases. I think the guys coming out now are a lot more well-rounded than we were back then. Did you go to a West Coast team or... Yeah. Coast. yeah, I was in one the whole time. And what year did you get to actually to a team? When did you actually get to your team first I team? I think I graduated October 23rd, 98. So I think I checked in probably a week later. So like late 98. For you at that point, you're now in a team. You're now functional. What were you thinking was going to be your long term for the military? <laughs> Uh, honestly, I was just, I was just trying to be a good new guy. I wasn't thinking long-term. I wasn't thinking anything. I was thinking, Hey, I've got, you know, my next challenge is uh, jump school. And I failed that. I had to go back and you know, tail between my legs, just checking in. Oh, that's right. I think I went to jump school first and then had to check in. So I had to check in as a dude who'd failed jump school, which I didn't know at the time, but it's actually pretty common. <laughs> There's about one guy per class that gets kicked out. So they were just making fun of me. I'm like, Oh, thank God. It's not like a big deal. Um, but at the time they had a check-in challenge where you're, you're checking in in your blues, like your, your dress blues. And they're like, attention on the quarter deck. And they get everybody like the entire command, dude, like there's probably like a hundred seals there and like, like 50 or hundred techs. There's a couple hundred people there and like mount the pull-up bar, which of course is like my weakest thing. <laughs> right. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm in my blues in my weakest event. And you got to do like they call it 20 pull-up challenge. So I start, I was slightly better at pull-ups then. So I start knocking out a few and like, no, on my count. I'm like, oh God, there goes three. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got a few in here. And so like up. So I'm like, okay, down. And it's like all the way down. So I'm like, oh dude, I'm not going to make 20 for sure. And then I think like looking back, I didn't realize the time because I only made it to like 10 or 12, I think. But they didn't really hassle me for it. And I think it's because I went up there until I couldn't do any more. And then I was just kept trying until my hands, like just, I couldn't grip the bar anymore. And as soon as I jumped down, I jumped right back up and just kept, kept trying to go. And they're like, okay, he's not that good, but he's trying hard. <laughs> That's kind of been my experience in, in buds in the military. Not that good, but I try really hard. <laughs> Taking it back to seal training and, and struggling with pull-ups. Was that never an issue for you in the sense of the number that you could do? Well, I only had to, like I said, it was a goal that I had to meet. And as long as I met that goal, that was fine. So I do everything I could to work up to that goal. But yeah. I struggled uh, on the Island for San Clemente. San Clemente Island is the last part of third phase for buds. And uh, when I was going through they in order to eat, dinner well dry anyway you had to do a pt <laughs> challenge and it would cycle through one day was like uh push-ups and sit-ups and one day was uh uh climbing frog hill which is like a basically sprint uphill and one day was uh pull-ups so i was okay on the other two days but pull-ups and with like a weighted kit of like 20 pounds and the first week was like 
10, second week was 12 and then 14. So I, every third day I was completely wet. It's just like, I just knew I'm not going to make it, but I got slightly better at it. But I eventually, that was a weakness that eventually I got into fitness and training and my max, the max ever, I think was like 32, 32 or 34, something like that at like two, two fifteen. I think so. I did, I did address it and I got better at it. Um, I can still do like 20 at 235, but I don't know. It's not, I just didn't want to suck at it anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> I guess if there's somebody who's listening, who's thinking about entering into that pipeline, you hear it a lot of just don't quit. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's where I'm going with this is even if you weren't the superstar, even if you were just barely meeting the minimums, as long as you showed them I'm not quitting until I get to wherever X is. That's all they want. Yeah. And uh, there was, now that we're mentioning it, there was, there was a few times in training where that exact thing occurred. And I didn't think of it at the time because I just thought that's what everybody did. Like you're coming to buds, you know, it's super freaking difficult. Like you should be prepared to just keep fucking going, you know? And so there's a few times I remember one of the things I struggled with was this event called life saving where you have the instructor in the pool and you've got to like jump in and save them. And with this, this instructor, uh, Gillespie, dude, this guy was like, had to be like two ninety. This guy's huge. I, I was six one. I couldn't even put my arm around this guy. He's like trying to wrestle a polar bear in the water, bro. This guy was enormous. And, uh, he was one of the guys that was tasked with going, he's like all the students dreaded him. Cause he's, he's like twice the size of any other student <laughs> there. And, uh, so I'm, I'm having to wrangle, wrangle this guy in and he's just toying with me and like pushing me around. I'm like, Oh, trying to, trying to bring him back and, and, uh, and not drown. And, and, uh, I'm just like, like physically exhausted, like, like cardio level, like just breathing hard, like holy shit. And I, I get out of the pool and like Williams fail. I'm like, ah, oh, not, not unexpected, you know? And so, but I'm like, I'm like dying, like breathing super hard. And the instructor's like, Williams, you're ready to go again. And I just like, okay, let's go. And he's like, ah, you're okay. Take a break. I think he, he just wanted to see that I was willing to step in and keep going, even though it was difficult. And then he saw that I was actually like, yeah, he's willing to do it. We'll, you know, not make him do it. And there was, there was a few times like that where I realized that maybe not everybody has that approach to it. Um, and you know, because I was also an instructor afterwards. So I did one platoon before 9-11 and then two platoons after 9-11. And then I went to S, uh, Buds as a third phase instructor. And I remember there's, there's always this thing about like, I'll die before I quit. It's like the popular thing to say. I don't I always look at the kids and I'm like, bro, there's a lot more helmets under the bill than there are dead bodies. So like, let's be realistic with this. So there is a point where you're going to quit for most people. There is a point. Um, most people are just, there are some people who, you know, smart or dumb, I don't know, but they will literally die before they quit. But that's not most people, you know, that's like maybe 1% of the people that even go to buds. So the way I looked at training was, I, I know it's hard going in. Here's what I'm willing to give to the program. And I'm just hoping that what the program asks of me is slightly less than that. And that, that is exactly how it worked out. Um, you know, by a lot of, a lot of chance, but, uh, you know, a lot of hard work, but yeah, that's exactly the way it worked out. Um, yeah, I'd like to say like, I'll die before I quit and all that <laughs> stuff, but it's just, it's just not realistic, man. You know, I think we're for somebody looking at it from the outside, what makes it interesting is, and, and I'm sure you got to see this as an instructor is so many people come to that line and they say, I want to challenge myself, but they hadn't done anything before that to really know if they're going to be able to meet that challenge. I don't think anybody knows really. I mean, it's kind of one of those things you just got to understand how difficult it is. You, you train the best you can, but there's really only so much you can prepare for. And you just have to go into it knowing like hey, there's a lot of, there's a lot that I don't know and I'm willing to learn and progress and I'm going to, I'm going to give it my best shot. You know, um, that's why I think there's a lot of similarities with, uh, Navy SEAL training and entrepreneurship is that, Nobody would get through buds if they thought it was easy. 
you get the first day and be like, what the heck is this? <laughs> like, no way, bro. Like, no way I'm doing this stuff, you know? But if you know it's hard, you're better prepared. And you're like, okay, I can handle the wet and sandy. I can handle the runs. I've prepared. I, I've been ready for this. And so it becomes easier. It's like if somebody comes out of the woodwork and punches you in the face. You're like, what the heck is going on? But if you're like, hey, we're going to get in a fight. We're gonna, I'm going to step into the ring. It's not unexpected. I think entrepreneurship is the same way where people have an unrealistic expectation of how easy it is. And so they go into it like, I'm just going to be a millionaire. I'm just going to make all this money. I'm going to buy this course or sell this course and whatever. And then they're not ready for the punch in the face. And they're like, holy shit, this is not what I was prepared for. And then they back off or they question themselves or they quit. And that's why I think it's very important to, to for people to understand how r- truly difficult entrepreneurship is. Because if you go into it knowing that it's hard, you're not going to be that surprised. And you have, by doing that, by having that mindset, you have a much greater chance of success because you're not going to be thrown off by the first punch. You'd be like, okay, well, I expected to get hit in the face. Now let's counter and move or whatever. Um, and that's really what entrepreneurship is. It's just, it's just solving problems. And I think if you can just, there's two key things to success in entrepreneurship. It's very simple. It's hard. It's a lot of work but it's not complicated. You just got to try to not make the same mistake twice and you got to keep going because eventually over a long enough timeline, if you don't make the same mistake twice. There's nowhere to go, but up. So eventually you'll succeed. So the only question after that is how, how can I compress that time? So it doesn't take 20 years. It can take, you know, realistically 10 years or five years. Um, I think three to five years is a realistic goal for something to like, if somebody's looking at a side hustle, and they want to get into entrepreneurship, they understand that it's hard, they found their thing, and they're like, okay, I want to build this. It's probably going to be three to five years before it's big enough where it can be their main thing. It's. It, I always recommend having a side hustle as your well, side hustle. <laughs> and the reason is there's, there's two main things about entrepreneurship. There's two um, schools of thought. Excuse me, two schools of thought for entrepreneurship. One is the sexy thing like, just go all in, burn the boats, fuck everything, we're going to go full speed ahead. And that sounds sexy and it sounds great. It's great sound bites, but it's really not a good plan. And to be honest, it rarely works out. Um, and the reason is that most companies aren't even profitable for nine to 18 months, you know? And even if they are profitable, it's usually percentage. So if you're doing $100,000 a year, but you're 20% profitable, you can't live off 20 grand a year, you know, but if you get it up, it takes you three years to get to a million dollars in 20% profitable, you can live off 200 grand. So it's a percentage of that. And it takes time to get to the point where that percentage is big enough where you can actually live on. So what I usually recommend to people is have, have your, your day job, your main thing, and then build up your side hustle until it is functioning and profitable and you have systems and processes and it's running parallel. And then you'll reach a point where the side hustle starts to impact your day job where you're like, shit, I could be spending time on this, but I got to do this. And I I reached that point where, uh, cause I, I built and sold three companies. I still had a day job. It wasn't until 2016 after was that eight, yeah, nine years of entrepreneurship that I actually quit my day job. So I I had nine years of doing side hustles and, um, I think that's the best way to do it because when you're growing a business, if you have to eat off it, like you're, you're taking people don't understand when you're starting a business, it takes money to grow it. It's actually really expensive to grow a company, which is the opposite. Cause when you think, Oh, my business is growing. I have all this money. It's the opposite. It takes all the money to grow the business. So if you have a side hustle that you can just roll the money back into the business and keep growing and growing and growing, you don't have to take money out for rent. You have to money out for groceries or phone bills or anything. You can grow that company a lot faster then if you're like, well, I, I could invest in more product, I could invest in more marketing, but I have to pay rent. It's going to take way, way longer to grow. So that's why one of the reasons I always suggest keep your day job, um, run a side hustle for as long as you can until you can't run them both anymore effectively. And that's the point where you got to make a decision of, of which one to leap. And I was that when I was instructing at SQT and it reached uh, the end of SQT. The end of 2016 is when I left SQT as a, as a uh, DOD civilian instructor there. And I'd already been running industry for two years at that point. And it was, I was making roughly like a hundred grand, uh, 
in my DOD job including like overtime and stuff. And so I was like, dude, I don't know if this company is going to be able to make up that, that volume. But I did know that like I was getting up at like four 30 in the morning, going to the print shop, approving stuff, getting to the office at like seven o'clock running, spending all day at the office, going home, doing emails, doing invoices, doing design work, processing everything and going to bed at like, you know, 11 o'clock at night, it, it wasn't sustainable. And my performance as an instructor started to suffer because I was focusing too much energy on this. And my business started to suffer because it needed more resources for me time than I was able to commit. And to be honest, I should have jumped six months earlier. I was just too much of a pussy and be like, Oh man, I don't know if the money is going to work out and I have no safety net. And, uh, but yeah, looking back, um, I immediately made up that money, uh, by spending that time that I was at the main job on the side hustle, which is now the main hustle and the, the growth it immediately made up for that. So it worked out. But if I tried to jump like two years prior or a year prior, it wouldn't have worked. It's kind of like surfing. Like you have to time that wave just right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's probably the most common question people have. Um, because at a certain point, if, if you're growing a business, you, you can't, you have a bandwidth issue and you, you can't do all of it all the time. And even if you're running ragged for that, like you can do it for a little amount of time, but you can't do it forever. You know? So is that, it's finding that balancing act between it being a side hustle and continuing to grow, but then it's going to come to a point where, Hey, all right, it's grown enough. I've got to take the leap of faith and make yeah. that the primary. Yeah. If you want to grow it though, cause that's also something you got to ask yourself. A lot of situations, like a lot of dudes in active duty military might have like a side hustle in real estate or something. And not every side hustle needs to turn into main hustle. You know, like you're in that situation, that guy's probably better off just investing in real estate, you know, one house a year, one house every couple of years, making an extra 10 to 20 to $30,000 a year doing that and keeping his main thing and getting his retirement and his benefits and all that at the end of like when he's in his, you know, fifties or sixties, he's probably going to be way further ahead than if he'd try to do just real estate or try to do just this one thing. So it's, it's an important thing. I know entrepreneurship is like the sexy new thing right now, but, um, to be honest, it's, it's not, it's not the right choice for, I would say most people, you know, um, I mean, it's the right choice for me, but I'm a, I'm a, weird dude. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned you did one enlistment part of nine 11. How much did nine 11 just completely change everything? Oh, one deployment. One deployment. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, were you still in your first enlistment during nine 11? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we just got back from our first deployment and I was sitting at home and uh, yeah, everything happened, but it, it was crazy how fast, uh, all the tactics that we thought would work were completely changed because we hadn't been, the SEAL teams hadn't been in a actually like sustained, like real world engagement since Vietnam. So we had like, was it 30 years of basically peace? So all our tactics were based on theory or some hand-me-downs from dev group who had done some basically like high level theory stuff, but it was all crazy theory and it, it nobody knew but looking back now, it's comical the things that we were doing, like bringing MP5s with like iron sights and to do housework. <laughs> and we're like, well, that's because the nine mil and the frag. And it made sense. But now looking back, like, no, that's asinine. You get short barrel M4s and maybe you put silences on them. Like, it, it just, nobody knew. But that's one thing I do like about the SEAL teams um, is that they're very out of the box. So like when something doesn't work, we throw it away. When something does work, we take it and we're like, cool, let's do more of what works. And they're very kind of like G Kundo in that sense where like we will pull from everything and then just, just use what works and, and trash what doesn't. Um, I think that, I think that does work in a lot in entrepreneurship. So I think that's one thing that, that, um, cause we work with a lot of team guys too, a lot of team guy clients and, uh, some of them are really, they take that skill set and they're really good at business because they're good at adapting. They're good at solving problems. And they, they, they move and change things and flow with it. But also, I don't know how many team guys you know, but man, we got big egos. And some of us, are like team guys are like my best clients and my worst clients. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But the guys that really struggle with it, and I think a lot of people, like high-level athletes have this problem too. Um, I imagine like squat guys probably have this, this issue too, or you've seen this issue, um, or spec ops guys, is where when you get really good at one thing, 
and doctors have this problem. Like you get really good at one thing. You think you're good at everything. And a lot of times you're not willing to be the new guy again. And you got to understand when you get out of the military, there are, there are some things that cross over, but for the most part, you're a new guy again and you got to go learn from everybody. Like the dudes who's had, you know, literally a sandwich shop for five years knows more than you. It doesn't matter. You're if the, the master chief of fucking dev group, dude, you get out that sandwich shop guy knows more about business than you. You got to be a new guy and go to the sandwich shop guy and be like, Hey man, like, how do you do this? Like, what's your cost of goods? What's your marketing plan? Like, how do you, what's your, your rent? How are your employees? Like there's so much that goes into it. And, um, a lot of guys aren't willing to be the new guy again and they're not willing to put their ego aside and they think like, I know everything. Um, and it's, it's really detrimental and I've never seen anybody succeed that doesn't have a good handle on their ego, at least not succeed at a high level. A lot of guys will, they'll get big and then, but they always crash and burn because their ego will, will get the benefit of them. But that's, that's the dichotomy of it too, is because you have to have a big ego to even want to do anything. You know, you have to have something and it's like, I want to do this. I want this to be seen. I want to create and build this, which is an ego play at its base level. So you have to kind of balance that. I call it like long-term and short-term ego. So like long, long-term ego, I want to build big shit. But in order to do that, I need people on our team who are willing to help me do this stuff. So I need to control my short-term ego. And when somebody comes in and be like, Hey, this is stupid. We need to do it this way. I can't be like, well, it's my way, this or that. Like, <laughs> because of what I said goes, um, I need to be like, Hey, you know what? Your idea is better. Let's, let's do your idea. That's really good. How many more of these ideas do you have? Like, let's, I really like the way you solve this problem. Let's collaborate on it and let's do more of this, you know? So you got to squash your short-term ego in order to achieve your long-term big ego goals. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. I, I know I've, I've struggled with it in, until I figured out what I needed to do to get where I want to go. And then it made more sense and made it easier for me to be like, not worried about how things are relayed to me. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't care how the information gets to me. Like if somebody says on a post or something like, Oh, you're all fucked up or this sucks. My first thing is, well, fuck you. It's like, well, is he right? Like, does our shit suck? What is he talking about? Do we have a hole in our game? Like, how can we solve this? And sometimes they'll be like, Hey man, you're right. Like we, we didn't do that very well, or we can improve this. Like, let's, let's change it. You know? Um, I think there's a lot of examples of that. In fact, one guy, this is a guy, Jimbo Fox, that had a, a comment on one of our ads, like, is your stuff made in America? It's super common. And I was like, hey, man, like we we print in the United States on imported blanks, um, and they're really good. They're really good quality. And I'll send you some. Like, here you go. I think you really like it. And to his credit, he was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. And he really did his due diligence. He's a power lifter guy. And he's like, uh, he's like, hey, man, I took it to the gym. I showed it to my friends. It's not our style. It's too thin. Uh, we like a different cut, different thing. And I was like, Hey man, thank you for your feedback and thanks for testing it. Like, that's really good. Um, and from that process, we went and all our new stuff is actually produced in LA, all made in the USA. And so now I just sent him out some stuff, um, yesterday to test again. I'm like, Hey man, thanks for your feedback. Like we made some changes. Here's the new iteration. Like, what do you think about this? And so it, you got to be open to feedback from all angles and not, not every time somebody talks shit is bad. You got to look at it. Like, are they right? Cause sometimes you got to crush your short term. You go to be like, I really want to build this. So this piece of information, this guy gave me, even though I didn't like the way that he gave it to me, <laughs> man, he's right. So I got to adjust wire and shift course so that I can achieve my goal. What was the impetus for you coming to the 10 year mark or wanting to create your first in business because i believe it was forged was your first business yeah. yeah me and mike sour started forge like 2007 um to be honest it was i apologize i have one of the hoodies and i didn't wear oh it. <laughs> no good thanks thanks for rocking it man yeah that was a really fun business i learned a lot and uh mikey and i were like really good friends and roommates for a long time uh love that dude and uh he and i were really good partners at least in the beginning uh because he was really good at the things that i wasn't good at and i was good at the things that he wasn't good at so we're able to build with that but the real reason we did it was uh, basically twofold like we just want to have more money i was tired of being poor and um i wanted more control over my life i wanted to have say of like where i went what i did with my time um i wanted to yeah that's really it just controlling my life 
but it's funny that the apparel side was like the very last idea that we had. We had probably a dozen business ideas and everything from like literally Navy SEAL party planners. Like <laughs> it's comical, <laughs> but like we had some wacky ideas down to like the tactical thing, which is every tactical guy's dream. Like I want to ranch with helicopters and all this stuff. And then we, we ran these, uh, these ideas through like five filters, based like how, how, how big can it possibly get? Uh, how long is it going to take us to get there? Um, how much money is it going to take to get there? How profitable is it? Like what's the net margin on this? And then what's the end state? Like, are we going to be able to sell this at a certain point? And we ran all our ideas through that filter and we realized, and also our assets, like what do we have to offer the world? What's different? And the only thing we had was being a Navy SEAL. So we're like, how can we, how can we allow other people to connect with the culture and the community that we're a part of and apparel was just a really good piece of it. And it happened to work out and we made designs that, that you know, meshed with people. We did some, some, uh, donation shirts for some, you know, unfortunate tragedies that happened and, and, uh, just started to tell a story about, you know, what the brand was, uh, what it meant to us, the story behind it. And, and it worked out, it worked out really well. Um, we made a lot of mistakes and I sold my half of that business in 2000, 12 to one of our employees uh it's still around but uh yeah we, i mean we learned a lot from that process but now looking back i'm like oh, that first five years my god i could i could do that in like 12 months now. <laughs> <laughs> from your perspective though at that point were you already seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as far as your military career yeah i knew i wanted to get out part of the reason was that um i was i never two deployments after 9 11 i didn't get to do anything I never got to go see combat anywhere. I never even got to go to Iraq or Afghanistan. We're always in like Djibouti, and other places in Africa and Paycom and all this stuff. And so I was pissed. So I went to be an instructor in third phase. And that's where I met Mikey Sowers because we're third phase instructors. And he had left to go to team five to go, uh, to go overseas. So I'm like, I'm at like nine years now. And I'm like, Hey man, I told my uh, senior chief at the, phase I was in. I was like, look, man, I've done three platoons, two after nine eleven. I haven't been able to do shit. Like, let me go jump in with team five. Let me go augment them and go do a deployment, actually do some real seal work and then come back and then I can, can reenlist, you know? And they're like, nope, we're too undermanned. You're the old, you're too valuable here. I'm like, dude, fuck you guys. And that was, that was really the big thing for me where I was like, dude, what am I going to do another? I'm going to go back to a team and chase the dragon again and maybe do another platoon or two and never get to do this again. So I was like, dude, I can either continue to chase the dragon, continue to have things out of my control and not be able to get to where I want to go. Or I can take a different route and try to build something that I have the most control over. But the problem with control, it also comes with responsibility. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely a double-edged sword. Did you already have the DOD job lined up when you were transitioning out? No, that, that just materialized. It happened to be, um, just lined up at the right time. I didn't even, I didn't even know if that, uh, option exists anymore. It was kind of like, these are pushing a lot of active duty team guys to go overseas because the, the war was ramping up. So they didn't have a lot of people to, to teach, uh, to actually instruct. So they pulled some people in civilian duty to go do it. Or as they opened up some civilian billets, for former military to go do it and just happen to be at the, you know, talk about surfing, like the right time at the right place with the right qualifications, knowing the right people. It just worked out, but no, it wasn't anything I planned. I didn't even know it existed until we, you know, until it popped up, but it was the perfect fit. Did you have a plan for yourself or what was the entrepreneurship still for you a side hustle at that point? Yeah. Yeah. We were just starting forge. It wasn't making any money and we were just, like spitballing and learning as we go. My plan at the time where contracting was really big at the time. So, so my plan was just go, go be a contractor somewhere and go do some stuff. That's all I knew, you know, from 19 in it was like just seal. So <laughs> when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did a short stint with kettlebells. Yeah. Another company that you got going. Yeah, that was fun. If there's something significant about that experience before we get into your company today and just mm -hmm. industry's thread works, is yeah. there something that came out of that that was poignant for you? Yeah. Um, 
man, I learned so much from that company. Uh, maybe the biggest thing as far as tactical for your audience is that that taught me about margins because our, our best selling kettlebell sold for 125 bucks. And for the audience, it was called Dima Bells and they had like faces on them. So we were, we were one of the first companies to come to market with faces on a kettlebell. And so it got pretty well known. Um, but our, our margin sucked because we were made in the U S and so I was selling a, a product for 125 bucks, but it cost me $85. So if I wanted to make 40 bucks, I had to spend 85. And so gathering inventory was very difficult. Um, and there's a whole lot that goes into that, but the, the, the primary lesson that people can learn from that is that like, you really got to look at the margins of a product and figure out it's if, if it's scalable or not. And, um, Right now, like with apparel, usually at volume, there's like a 400% markup. So if you buy a t-shirt for, so if you're selling a t-shirt for 30 bucks, you should be trying to get that, that t-shirt at scale anyway, like a thousand units at like 750. So that you get 750, $15, 300 or 30 bucks, so 400% markup. So when you got a product like a kettlebell, that's like, I mean, what is that? 20% margin all in that's before any other any other costs I'm like, dude, we weren't making hardly any money on it at all. Um, so that was a big wake up call for me. But the thing that worked with that was that they became pretty well known, uh, especially cause Dave Castro from CrossFit, like really hooked it up and put us in the games and everything. So it boosted us quite a bit, but I still wasn't making any money on the kettlebells. So what I did was I took this unique product that we had, which is, you know, faces with, with faces on kettlebells and I put them on keychains, and uh, that cost me like four bucks for the keychain. And we sold them for sixteen plus four bucks for shipping and handling. And instead of having like your garage full of like 50, <laughs> 70 pound kettlebells, a huge pain in the ass to to ship and to store and everything, I had a drawer full of like a couple hundred of these things. And we're making way more money on on the keychains than we ever did on the kettlebells. I was like, oh, this is so much better. I got 800% markup on this product. I can store 100 of them in a drawer. I can ship them anywhere in the world way easier than kettlebells. Um, and if somebody, if it gets lost or somebody doesn't like it or it gets broken, like, I'll just send them a new one. It cost me $4, you know? So that was really eye-opening for me from a, from a tactical perspective, like number one, got to control the margins or know that, but also two, just cause your primary product has shit margins doesn't mean that you can't create accessory products that have great margins. Um, supplements are like that. So like most supplement companies, they basically break even on, uh, what you call protein because it's so expensive to produce good protein, but they make great margins on a lot of the other products like pre-workout might have, you know, 600% markup or something like that. So sometimes you'll have this product that might be your, even your key thing. Um, but it doesn't always have to be your, your moneymaker. You know? Not to put it in a negative light, but when you look back at getting into the kettlebell market, mm -hmm. looking back on it, what you know now, I guess where I'm going with this is somebody may have an idea, hey, man, I really want to do X, mm -hmm. but like you said, you, you evaluate it and your prof, the margin's just not there. Yeah. In hindsight, would you not have done that? I won't do it again. <laughs> i tell you that. Um, there are a lot easier ways to make money. Uh, and also, you got to look at the, the actual people in the market, too. Kettlebell people are weird. Like, CrossFit people are weird, but I'm a CrossFit guy. I've like, had a CrossFit gym. We grew up in CrossFit. Um, but kettlebell people within CrossFit were super weird. And so, like, we would get all these weird questions and weird it, it was just an odd, they're odd people to deal with. So, and not that that's a de deterring factor, just one factor. Um, the other thing was not just the margins, but it has to be easy to store, easy to ship, easy to package. Um, and these are the things I just didn't consider with that company. And we, we expanded into different products and it helped, you know, help move things around. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't do it again, uh, simply because the logistics of a company like that are just way too complicated for way low margin. I only made money on that company when I sold it. That was the only thing. Um, but surprisingly, a lot of companies are like that. And actually <laughs> I was running, uh, my second clothing line. I was talking to, the uh, the guy who owned a print shop that uh, we partnered with at the time. And he, he's always been like really good mentor for me in the clothing industry. Taught me a lot. And I was like, bro, I like the company's growing. Like we're selling a good amount, but like, I don't feel like I have any money. It's like, oh, it's because you're growing. 
Like you'll never feel like you have money until you, you, you stop growing or you sell it. I was like, Oh, I don't feel like a loser now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cause I felt like I was doing something wrong. I'm like, dude, we're growing, but like, I don't have any freaking money. What is going on until he told me that's normal. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's normal. And every, every company that I've built has been the same way. Like we just don't have any money until you get to a certain point And then that percentage you can pull out is big enough. Um, or you sell it. Yeah. How many other iterations did you go through before actually founding Industry Threadworks? I forged and then two other clothing lines and then the kettlebell company. But it wasn't until I sold the kettlebell company where it was enough money where uh, I could take a little break and be like, okay, what do I want to do next? And then, because um, right now for the audience, Industry Threadworks does, we we help apparel brands grow and scale. We handle their manufacturing process, branched off and doing fulfillment and stuff too. So we handle a lot of like the logistics for clothing brands. And, uh, I was talking with a buddy of mine, or I didn't know him, but I saw his brand online. I'm like, this is a cool brand. And I went to order a shirt and it was like a terrible process. And I'm like, bro, and so I shot him a message. I'm like, Hey man, like I really want to buy a shirt, but like this checkout process is ridiculous and like what like if i'm the only asshole that's like <laughs> saying this like just disregard right you know but if you're getting other messages like this there's probably a problem and you could probably make a lot more money by fixing this stuff and i said like hey i'm, I'm not I've, I've built and sold a couple of pair lines like i'm not just some random customer like I can, i'm happy to help where i can because i think you have cool stuff and so we ended up helping him grow from like hundred thousand a year to four and a half million and uh i was like okay well there's something to this and then very back from like 2007, we'd always been producing apparel for other brands because like you've had apparel produced, it's way harder than it looks like 50% of the time. It doesn't come out how you want. It's in the wrong placement. The ink's all jacked up and it, it it's not as simple as it seems. And so as I was running the apparel lines, cause I was running production for forge and, and my own stuff. Um, we get, I approach. will say from the outsider's perspective, it does seem like it should just be very easy. Right. It should be. Yeah. It, <laughs> it's, it's surprisingly complex. Yeah. Um, so we would have our other friends who are running businesses who are having the same problem dealing with print shops. They're like, no communication, no timeline, wrong product, wrong placement, wrong inks, or like every possible problem you can have. And they're like, Hey, you're running an apparel line. Your, sh your shit looks tight. Like, can you make ours? So right from you know, 2007, we've been doing this for other brands. Well, I've been doing this for other brands and, uh, I just, we didn't make it an actual thing until I sold all the other stuff. And I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do next? Let's try this out. And then it ended up growing. And now it's, um, it's been fun, man. We, we started unofficially 2014. So we're 10 years in now and it's been, it's been wild, man. We get to work with so many cool people, so many cool brands. Uh, we know almost everybody in the apparel space now, like got to have dinner with, with Dan, the former CEO of grunt style, um, talking with, you know, the guys from nine line, like we, we know all these guys, you know, some of them we work with, some of them we don't, but, but it's really a small community in the apparel world. And, um, it's been really cool, man. Cause all those guys are very interesting people. Like they're all main characters. They're all doing really cool shit. So even though a lot of times we don't get to work with them, um, because they have their own production capacities or fulfillment or whatever they're already set. Um, it is really cool. We just bounce ideas off of and talk like, Hey man, we're, we're having our other clients having problem with marketing. Like, what are you doing for marketing? How are you fixing this? So we end up becoming a hub for a lot of information for these guys. So we end up with a lot of solutions on how to fix these problems. Like I, I've been running my own brand for, I think maybe six or eight years before I started doing this. But the first two years of running industry, I learned more in two years from working with all these other brands than I did from the previous six or eight years running my own brand. Because when you're running your own brand, you only see things from your perspective. So like, oh, this is the problem. I don't know how people solve this. But when you have insight on dozens and dozens of other brands, you're like, everybody's having this problem. And then you, somebody solves it. We're like, hey guys, here's a solution. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do this. So we, be, we just became a hub for a lot of solutions and that creates a lot of conversations. So we end up knowing a lot of people in the apparel industry. It's, it's fun, man. It's really cool. Um, we only get to work with a few of them because you know, most of them are the really successful ones. Anyway, they already have their stuff set. Um, but it's been, it's been cool, man. I, I really enjoy it. I don't know if we're gonna do it forever. Uh, I do want to, 
probably dial it back a little bit and just work with like a handful of clients rather than like everybody. Um, but it's been, it's been really rad. And recently, cause we were in B2B this entire time. Like we, we've had our own shirts, but we sold like maybe one a month, you know, <laughs> like on accident. Uh, but now we just refocused about six months ago on reframing industry as, as a retail brand. And dude, it's been so fun. Like I get to be creative again. I get to do design work. I get to think creatively rather than like logistics and processes and systems, which you can be creative with too, but not in the same way that you can with, with like actual art and apparel. Um, then we do photo shoots and it's just been a, a completely different vibe, completely different dynamic. And man, I love it. I, I feel, I feel like at home back in the driver's seat of like a, a retail apparel brand, you know, rather than a manufacturing system, you know? Where I want to go now is the importance of building the right team around you. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. you talk about all the things that your company is doing today, but you, you also had a really horrible experience <laughs> in kind of putting the control in somebody else's hands and yeah. maybe not monitoring as well as you should. Tell me yeah. about that. Oh man. I, I almost lost my whole company. It's probably about three years ago now. But yeah, I was, uh, at the time I was like, grow, grow, grow all costs, just grow. And we did, we grew pretty big. Um, and we had like 24 people on staff. We had three warehouses and a big, like really nice glass, uh, HQ space. And, uh, I felt like a real adult entrepreneur, <laughs> <laughs> but I was making so many mistakes that I just hadn't been big enough previously to, to know that they were mistakes or what to look for. So what happened was, um, you're right with people like system scale, but you need people to operate the system. So in order to, in order to have a team that operates those systems, you need to become a leader or a better leader. And I, that was always a weak point of mine. I was, I was never a leader in the teams. I was never really good at any of that stuff or even really good at being, being with people in general. So, um, I had to kind of figure out how do I become a leader for these people? And so i learned a lot from Jocko's podcast, talk with him. He's one of our clients too, which is cool. He's one of the seals that's actually cool to work with. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I learned a lot from him and I was trying to apply these principles. And one of them was You're the only one who's learned anything from him. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I'm trying to apply these principles of a, uh, with a like detached command or something where I'm like, Oh, you hire good people and you get out of the way and let them do the work. And so I tried to do that and I, I hired the wrong person and, uh, I missed out on some key steps. I didn't check their shit. I didn't, uh, Ed my light talks about this a lot where you inspect what you expect. And I didn't do that. I'm like, no, no, he's good. He's good. I'll, I'll let him do his thing. I don't want to micromanage because I, I was a micromanager and I was trying to do off that. So I went completely pendulum swing the opposite way and I didn't check shit. So what happened was we had expanded and we're doing like 7 million at the time. And we had all this warehouse space and all this overhead. Our payroll is like 1.1 million a year. And, and that's not a high margin business either. Like manufacturing, super low margin. So even though the top line might be okay, our net is like very, very much lower. And so I was like, okay, our system is we're taking care of apparel brands. So what do apparel brands need? They need marketing, advertising, content creation, production, fulfillment, Eat, like all these things, customer service. So my thought of the time is like, let's just build it all. That way we run stop shop for everything, which makes sense. And I, I, I do want to get back there. The problem was we way outran our capital because I hired this guy as a CFO and um didn't check his shit and every time we're going to expand because i was trying to stay out of his way i was like hey man do we have we have money to hire marketing people uh do we have money to get this other warehouse do we have money to do this stuff his question was always like oh let me check yeah yeah we can do it so i'm like okay cool so a couple of things happen and he leaves the company and we look under the hood and we're like holy shit not only do we not have money to do any of this we've been losing 20 to $30,000 a month for a long time. We're like half a million in the hole. We're like, what the fuck has been going on here? And it was my fault. Cause I, I hired the wrong person. I didn't check. Um, I wasn't a good enough leader where like he could actually like ask me stuff. Basically I'm the CEO at the time. It was my fault. And, uh, <clears throat> dude, that was probably without a doubt, not probably without a doubt, the hardest 
couple days of entrepreneurship, like b- before we figured out what was wrong and how to fix it, like we found out what was wrong, but we didn't know how to fix it yet. And we realized, holy shit, we have no capital. We can't pay. We have hundreds of thousand dollars in bills we owe. We have no money. And what the fuck are we going to do? And um, this is the importance of good partnership and like marriage. Uh, and now my wife's a CEO. She's a fantastic operator. But at the time, before we figured out what to do, I was laying up and staring at the scene at like 4.30 in the morning. I like couldn't sleep. I'm like, dude, how did I get us into this mess? What am I going to do? Like, I'm a bad entrepreneur, like all these things. I'm like, what the fuck are we going to do with all this stuff? And uh, she just looked over, man, over at me and she's like, hey, babe, I, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to figure it out. I was like, oh my God, I married the right person. <laughs> huge, huge thing. So that was a couple days and it was only through uh, the act of me talking about it and being open with my friend group of like, hey guys, like I'm, I'm fucked. Like this is the problem I'm facing. I don't know how to handle this. Like what do we, what do we do? You know? And I was super open and honest with everybody. Even like my friend who, uh, the partner print shop we work with, I owed him like 300 grand. And I told him, I was like, Hey man, like here's what's going on. Like I can get you 15 grand today. I can get you eight grand on Tuesday and like 10 grand on Thursday. And we always set our timelines and we always set our number amount and we work with him. He's still like, we're still great friends and we work together. So it's not the dollar amount. It's like how you, how you handle the dollar amount, I think is more important. Um, and what ended up solving it for us was, uh, it was my buddy, Jonathan Federa, who's a, a finance guy. And we'd, we talked, but I, I forgot that he did this. And another guy's like, Hey, why don't you talk to Jonathan? He's a, uh, he does all this stuff. And I tried to get like a hard money loan for like a hundred grand, which is going to be like 70% interest. And like, it was crazy. And thank God I got turned down for that. Cause I ended up talking to Jonathan. He's like, bro, yeah, I do this all the time. I'll get you a half million dollar SBA loan for 2.9%, uh, 30 years. And you don't have to pay anything back for 18 months. I'm like, are you fucking shitting me? Are you shitting me? This is what I had to do. He's like, yeah, no problem. And I, we had the money in eight days. This guy literally saved my entire business, but it was only because I was open and honest with my friend group and I had a good friend group that were really capable people that like really knew their shit. But that was a wild time, man. Um, but that's kind of like entrepreneurship, dude. Like there's going to be times like that. And I was reading stories about like, you know, Bezos and and Phil Knight from Nike and, you know, uh, Musk and, and Apple and all these things. And there's not a single one of those guys stories that they don't almost go bankrupt multiple times. Like not just once, like a close call, but like multiple times all the time. And I realized like, Whew, it made me feel better. I'm like, okay, I am an idiot for doing this stuff, but it's fairly normal. And we figured it out and we learned. And now we're, we're back to normal. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's just how entrepreneurship is. It's not this thing. Like where you see somebody with a Lambo on Instagram, some 24 year old kid, like buy my stuff and I'll teach you like, dude, fuck you. You're completely full of shit. Like it's a fight, man. It's a fight every day. And if you haven't been punched in the face yet, it's coming and you gotta be ready. And as soon as you dust yourself off from one, another one's coming around the corner and it's just, it's a constant struggle. And that's why I don't think it's the right choice for most people, because I don't think they have a really good picture idea of what it is. Cause most people don't talk about this stuff. They don't talk about the times they almost lost their business or the times where they failed. And, and I think if more people did, um, more people have a good time with entrepreneurship because you just know that's part of it. You know, like, like buds, when you're going, it's shitty, it's really not fun. But when you're having a miserable time with your friends, you kind of enjoy it. And you're like, ah, this cold water sucks. You know, like, oh, we're all so cold and shivering. Oh, pee on me. It's warm in here. Like it's just some weird stuff that happens when you're cold. But um, yeah, I think just being open and honest with this stuff is a huge huge part of it and that you just got to have a good friend group around you that you can lean on um because it is a lonely journey man like a lot of your other friends like i have other friends who aren't entrepreneurs i've been friends with for years we're still friends but they don't understand it the same way that i do they don't understand the pressure of like you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in bills or millions of dollars in in overhead and like they just don't get it you know and it's fine like it's just a different life but um, I do think there's a lot of uh, it's a lot of benefit and honor in being honest about things. And I think if more people are honest 
and your life is just so much easier if you're honest. I would say it goes back to your comment previously about checking your short-term ego yeah. because you and your wife could have talked about it, but your ego could have overridden, oh man, I don't want to, I don't want right. to look like shit in front of my friends. I'm embarrassed. They've seen me driving the Lambo. Now I got to, mm-hmm. whereas, hey, check the ego and just go right. and, and not necessarily talk to somebody because you're looking for a solution. Just be open with people. Yeah. About, hey, I'm struggling. Yeah. And it's honestly what I found too, is that most people you talk to, they won't have the solution, but through those conversations, they usually have somebody in their orbit that does have a solution that they can connect you with. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just a matter of like just having good conversations with people and being open and honest and, and trying to help as many people as you can. And just by the nature of doing that, like we're in the, the B2B space. So like the more conversations we can have about apparel and most people we talk to aren't going to be our clients, you know, but the most, more people we can help, uh, they want like 10 shirts. Like that's not our jam Our normally a hundred, hundred plus, you know, medium to high volume is our thing. So somebody wants like a dozen shirts. We, we can't do it, but I'll tell them the best blanks to use. I'll tell them how to talk to their print shop. So they, they get what they want. I'll tell them the right inks to, to look for and kind of the, the process. So it helps them. And when they do that, so now we're, they're not a client of ours, but we try to help them so much that every conversation that guy ever has about apparel, they'll eventually reach a person who's like, man, I, I, I got a clothing line and we're doing half a million a year and do my print shop is screwing up all this stuff and they're always late and there's no communication. They're like, Hey, you know what? I didn't use them, but I know a guy who does exactly that. You guys should talk. And we get honestly almost a hundred percent of our business just from that, just from trying to help people and being top of mind in, in conversations about, about apparel. I know a little bit about business, but I know a lot. Most of what I know about business is what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, staying in that vein, for somebody who might be in a position where they're looking to hire a CFO mm-hmm. with the ability to look back on it now, obviously you would have been more involved, but any other little things that you would have put in place now if you were in that same position? <laughs> to be honest, I don't think we were even big enough to need a CFO. CFO is probably like, you know, 10 million and above. Um, I just wanted to be big. So it's like, Oh, I'll be CEO. The, the typical title thing, like well, Disney's a COO and you're a CFO and we did all this stuff. And, and we, tr- we tried to like, like it's like when you're a kid and you play house. <laughs> That's what I looking back is kind of what I felt like we were doing. And uh, it, it didn't work, but honestly, I don't think, I don't think we needed a CFO. I think we just needed a clear visibility of the numbers and what, what ended up, helping us a lot and that we, we now implement with everything is each department because we had like five departments at a time each department had its own pnl like profit and loss statement and even like we had five brand managers on in our brand management department and we did a profit and loss statement on each one of those brand managers and we found out that like three of our departments weren't profitable and our brand management department was profitable but only two of our brand managers were profitable So we, when we had to make cuts, we're like, Hey, it's the boat is sinking. Like we have to throw people overboard or the everybody's going down. And it's not like we had to fire a lot of people, but, or lay them off, but it's not like you kill them. You know what I mean? And like, it's, we went from 24 people to like six. It was a massive change. And now we have one location, but we're way more profitable than we ever were. So it's, it's, it's a massive, massive shift. Um, and it sucks. I hate firing people. That's like the freaking worst, dude. I like hiring people. I like bringing people in and having to do stuff. But I, man, the worst thing is firing people. It's got to be hard for you, especially when you, you're you in that position where, in a weird way, it's like your family. And, yeah. and, and you've taken ownership yeah. of their growth. And now all of a sudden, you got to take a step back and go, I can't do this. Yeah. Like, I failed, guys. Like, you guys didn't fuck up. Like, I fucked up. I'm the one who got us in this situation and now I'm impacting your life by having to let you go because of a mistake that I made. And that's the worst dude. Cause like you feel like, I feel like such a piece of shit doing that. It sucked, man. And most of the people we had on staff were like really good people too. It was just like very frustrating, but honestly they all like, none of them are homeless. They all went and got like honestly better jobs than they had with us anyway. And we wrote them like a letters of recommendation and honestly worked out, worked out great in the long term, but at the time it's like, man, that was, that was one of the worst feelings. It's like 
having to fire people, especially because of mistakes that I made, not even mistakes that they made. I didn't hit on this before, and I want to ask real quick, any issues with you transitioning out of the military and coming into the civilian world? Um, I think I've embraced it a lot. I, I, uh, I pushed a lot of my old military friends away when I was getting into entrepreneurship because a lot of them just didn't understand. And I was in my late twenties, early thirties, and most of my friend group in the military was still active. And you, you view things differently when you're active than when you're out. And you tend to, especially team guys love to talk shit. <laughs> so they're always like poo poo and everything. And so you get a lot of shit talking from communities. Like I feel like, like SWAT or, or SEAL teams or spec ops teams, like high level people are always going to, you're competitive. And so you're always going to, there's a little healthy amount of talking shit, but a lot of times it spills over into unhealthy talking shit. Uh, called the, the crab pot mentality. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Where the, for the audience that hasn't, um, crab pot mentality is like you have a bucket of crabs and any one crab can climb out. But as soon as a bucket, as soon as a crab gets to the top, the other crabs get back, down pulling back down. So crab bucket mentality. And I, I recognize that in a lot of my friend group at the time was th they were good people. They just didn't understand where I wanted to go. And they, they ended up like trying to pull me down. So I ended up just arm's length, like pushing a lot of these people away. Um, not because they're bad people. It's just that I, I needed separation so that I could climb out all the way. Um, but now that I'm, now that I'm older, uh, I'm trying to reconnect with a lot of those dudes and they're, they're in a different position now too. Cause a lot, most of them are out now and they're like, Oh shit, I get it. I was talking shit cause I didn't, I didn't know how hard it was. I didn't know all this stuff. I didn't know the world looked like this. Yeah, or at least from that perspective. That's the huge thing, I think, is our our social circle will often talk shit because they are either afraid or they don't understand the right. bigger picture. Yeah. And it's easier for them to stay in their bubble and try to bring you back down. Yeah, exactly. And I, I used to be that way, too. Like, when I was a, a, a new guy, like a, a young SEAL, I would poo-poo everything. Well, these guys wearing tight pants. It's so lame, blah, blah, blah. And now, like... I think tight pants look awesome. <laughs> We're tight <laughs> pants all the time, dude. We're tight shirts, tight pants. Like, but it's just one of those things. Like I had, I had to purposely stop caring about shit and, and audit who I cared about. And that gave me so much freedom to follow my own path where I didn't have to worry about, you know, Joe Schmo, a random person. Like, dude, I don't care. You're a piece of shit. Mm, or whatever. You look lame. Okay. They don't care. The one other thing that I, and I, I do tend to, find myself peripherally following a lot more entrepreneurs these mm -hmm. days. And one of the things that I've heard is you constantly need to reevaluate your circle, the people that are around you. And as soon as you're no longer improving, it's evaluate the people yeah. around you. Are they pushing you forward or are they pulling you down? Yeah. And so just because your circle is what it is today, it may not be the same in five years or 10 years mm -hmm. from now. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And and people progress. And I think the important thing is that if you're a person who wants to progress and wants to create and build new things and, and evolve yourself as a person, you're eventually going to outgrow the other people with you, at least at that time. Because it's like a stream, like just because you're treading water doesn't mean you're staying still. If you're, if you're only treading water, you're actually going backwards. You have to be able, you have to progress in order to even stay where you're at and you have to progress hard intentionally to get ahead. And a lot of people don't. And that's why you get these, these uncle Rico complexes where like back in my days, we throw football over the mountains and they talk about like the guys who peaked in high school. And th there's a lot of that in, especially in like high, uh, I won't say high output, but like high achievers, like they, they achieve something. And a lot of them just, ride those coattails forever, you know? And, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of seals are like that. And I, I look at it like I want Navy seal to be a footnote on my tombstone, not the headline, you know? So I'm trying to build more stuff so that that that's not the main thing that, that people know me for or whatever. It's cool. I'm glad it adds character to my story, but that's not all I am. I was a very average team guy. Like I was going to write a book about the things that I did. <laughs> the most boring book ever. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of street fights, but no fucking, no gunfights. Um, oh, come on. I worked for Marcinko. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Some wild ride for you. Where do you see yourself going forward? I know watching you on social media, you're getting in and maybe it's just a, a misinterpretation. 
but you're getting more into retreats of bringing like-minded business people together. Yeah. And that's, that's not a money making thing. It actually cost me <laughs> money every time, but I, it's, it's that defining success. And now that I'm, you know, 46, I'm like, dude, what do I want to be doing at 50 and who do I want to be doing it with? Cause there's a ton of different ways to make money. And I realized like, I'm, I'm always going to figure it out. I have a great wife. She's a fantastic partner, relatively smart with her stuff. We have a great network of friends. Like we'll figure it out. Like we'll always have enough money to like enjoy life, you know? So once I realized that it made me a little less scared of like losing everything. So I thought to myself, like, you know, what does success look like to me now? And it's really like, I want to have experiences and I want to control the environment and I want to put together these really cool things where all the, the people who I value in my life, all the people whose opinions I, I respect and care about, let's get together and let's do cool stuff. And most of them just happen to be entrepreneurs, not all of them. And so when we get these things together, we've got guys who are, you know, fantastic marketers and we got guys who are really good on, you know, product development. We got guys who are really good at real estate. And so they have these conversations. And one of the coolest things is being able to see all these guys having different conversations and they're exchanging numbers and they're learning from each other and they're all helping each other. I'm like, this is what I want to do. Like, this is success to me. This is what I, I want to do more of this. So it's like, how do I, how do I do more of that? So that's what we're figuring out is, is how to do it. Um, but it's not, it, it's, I don't think we're ever going to like sell tickets or anything to it. It's kind of like I, I book the place, put out the list. And then if people want to get a room, we split the rooms or whatever. Um, but yeah, each time it still costs me a couple grand, but honestly, there's not, I mean, cars are cool, like, but I'd rather spend my money on that. That, that to me is success to be able to do that and have a really cool, diverse group of friends that are all like main characters. That's actually what we call the groups. <laughs> it's like a main character group. <laughs> but yeah, it's fun. Um, I, I don't know what's going to come of it, but I, I think the goal is that we're going to try to do like four of those a year uh, where people can fly in and, and, you know, just reconnect and get together. Cause I mean, like to talk about dude, it, it's a lonely journey, dude. And you feel all alone most of the time. And uh, I'm really lucky that, Disney is, Disney's my wife's name. Like the Disney is, she's the CEO. She's my partner and all this stuff. So like, I don't, I never feel alone, but man, if, if you don't have a partner who's in it with you, like, dude, I, I can't imagine how lonely that would feel. Cause I did have that for a long time or I didn't have that for a long time. And dude, I felt like I was going crazy. I'm like, am I the only one who sees the world this way? And then you meet other entrepreneurs and like, no, we're all just a little bit crazy. <laughs> I would almost say I'd like to end the podcast right there because I do believe in that 100%. Success comes from having that right person in your corner. Yeah. And and I don't even want to underplay this, but you go back to your time in the teams. You didn't do anything by yourself. It was yeah. always with a partner. Right. You know, yeah. and there, there's something about having that person that you know you can rely on, especially when the struggle is there. Mm -hmm. Where I'd like to go with this now is just anything in wrapping up the last pieces of advice for a veteran coming out wanting to maybe get into their own an entrepreneur space or anything like that yeah um honestly it's, it's very simple just trust yourself um i've i know a lot of people who are i know a lot of really smart people who are poor i know a lot of really rich people who really aren't that smart it's not a matter of smart in fact what i've noticed is that the more smart you are the more you overthink things and then you don't do things because you're like, what if, what if, what if, and then you don't do anything. And the people who are really successful, I mean, this is generalization, of course, they're like some of my friends who are rich are like very, very smart people, but there are also some people I know that are pretty fucking dumb. <laughs> They're like have hundreds of millions of dollars. And so I look at like what they just do shit. They don't worry about it. They don't overthink it. They're like, I want to do this. I'm going to do it. And they do it and it doesn't work. And then they fix it and do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So they've got 10 iterations done while the smart person is sitting back. I'm like, well, what if this, what if that? And I, I like to think of myself as like a relatively smart person. So I have definitely struggled with that. And what I found is that I gave up on, on knowing all the, all the plan, right? So I basically have my plan now is I have two, I only need to know two things. Number one, I need to know where I want to go. Cause I can't just like, it's like, it's like a map, right? Like you need to know where you want to go. First off, you can't just go this direction. You're very likely to go that way. 
and I know I want to go in this general direction and I know what the first step is. And I think I might know what steps two and three and four and five are, but I've never been right. I've never, ever been right on what that is. So I'll take step one. And by taking step one, I learn more information about what step two should be. And then I'm like, okay. And then by taking that next step, I learn what step three should be. So I'm never more than like one step out. You know what I mean? I have an idea of where I want to go, but it's very rare that I'm right. So my point in saying that is that if you're overthinking it, it's because you're smart. <laughs> so, but you have to, you have to control that. It's like, it's like your ego. Same thing with that. You have to control that. Like, okay, I'm overthinking this, but you have to recognize that in yourself. Like, is this a real problem or is this something that I could just pull the trigger on and then figure it out? And I think most things, um, if you think about like the worst case scenario, in most cases, it's, it's really not that bad, you know? So what if, what if this, what if that imagine the worst case scenario and that happens, you're like, Oh, Okay. And then it makes it easier to pull the trigger. And I think if you just, just iterate, 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 just do, do, do things, um, you're going to get a lot further on your goal than trying to map it all out or plan it all out before you take those steps. Um, because personally I I've been wrong a hundred percent of the time, the, the path, like I've gotten to where I wanted to go sometimes, but the path never looked the way I thought it would. It always took changes and, and reverse course sometimes. And it, it, it was never a straight shot and it was never, it never looked like how I thought it was. So I would invite you guys, if you're listening to this, trust yourself, just fucking go do it and trust yourself to figure it out. I appreciate your time. All the best. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you watching, but before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also any comments are appreciated. Thank you.